something just killed my dog. Something killed your dog? My dog went flying through the air over the tree. I don't know how it did it. Okay. Deep in Bigfoot Territory, Episode 4 Port Chatham, Alaska This is a Squatch Mafia documentary Along the rugged Alaskan coast lies Port Chatham, also known as Port Lock, an abandoned coastal fishing town on the southern Kenai Peninsula Its ruins stand as an eerie testament to a dark history where folklore morphs into reality and where the distinction between facts and mythology blurs. The legends that have haunted this place for centuries cast a spell of terror. And darkness beckons those who venture to seek the truth behind the mystery of this long abandoned village. In the depths of the coastal wilderness of the Kenai Peninsula, where the enigmatic becomes the frightening, Port Chatham is a gate and a reminder that, in the shadows and the dark corners of the earth, the unexplainable may still roam. Port Chatham, or Port Lock, was a small settlement about 130 kilometers southwest of Anchorage on the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska. The history of Port Lock dates back to the 18th century when Russian fur traders came to the area to hunt. The place was named after Captain Nathaniel Port Lock, a British sailor who anchored here in 1786. Captain Portlock, a member of the British Royal Navy, found sanctuary here in winter of 1786 during his Alaska expedition and praised the site. In the late 19th century, Port Chatham was used as port for trading fish and fur goods. Some of the first residents were Russian traders and native fur hunters who settled close to the area. Later American settlers also came and settled as fishermen and miners. Around 1900 an American firm brought in a fleet of fishing boats and built a cannery to take advantage of the calm waters and the healthy run of salmon. The village of Port Chatham grew around the cannery and the local chromite mine, nestled between the sea and vistas of snow-covered mountains. By 1921, residents established a post office. In the early 1920s, Port Chatham experienced a small boom that led to an increase in population and a higher demand for supplies and goods. In 1927 a road was built from Seldovia to Port Chatham. However, the story of the village was short and began to end in the 1930s, as the trade in fur and fish declined. Many residents moved away to find work elsewhere and the settlement was completely abandoned by 1949. Over the decades legends and rumors persist that the abandonment of Port Chatham was primarily due to missing residents of the town, unsolved murders and mysterious and haunting encounters and sightings in the forests and coastal areas around Port Chatham. Various articles, newspaper reports and books have documented the events since the late 1960s, many eyewitnesses and former residents of the village have been interviewed. Many residents of the nearby settlements of Seldovia, Nanwalek, and Port Graham still believe to this day that the area around the abandoned village of Port Chatham is haunted land. These stories don't commence with European explorers, but with indigenous people that have inhabited the peninsula for thousands of years. The Kenai Peninsula is steeped in history, where native Alaskan tribes such as the Dean people, the Tlingit and the Athabascans have lived for generations. Their stories and legends speak of large humanoid creatures, the Nantinok, or the Kushtaka, that wander in the dark wilderness of the peninsula. 
the area of Port Chatham never has been settled by native people and is said to be cursed since generations and centuries. Since countless generations this region of the Kenai Peninsula is seen as habitat of what the natives call Nantinok, or Kushtaka. Kushtaka, a Tlingit term, can be translated to land otter man, while the Athabascans and the Dean refer to the creature as Nantinok, a Dean term, used in the Kenai Peninsula dialects. It is literally translated those who steal people. There are famous stories in native mythology in which people had actual encounters with the Kushtaka or the Nantinok. The indigenous people of the region fear the creature and avoid it, not to attract its attention or disturb its territory. It is also believed that the creature is a kind of patron saint for the region's wildlife and that it can bring disaster and misfortune if disturbed. The stories about the creature known as Kushtaka or Nantinok are deeply rooted in the culture and history of the indigenous people of the Kenai Peninsula. It is believed that these beings are living in the area since ancient times, interacting with the people and animals of the region. There are many different versions of the legends about the creature, but some common features seem to prevail. In many stories it is described as large and hairy, with human-like features and often with red eyes. Some stories also tell of its smell, which is described as fishy or musty. The creature is believed to be intelligent and spiritual, and capable of imitating human language. Some stories tell of indigenous people who were able to speak with the Kushtaka or Nantinok and the creature is described as trickster-like, putting people in danger or playing pranks. In other versions of the legends the creature is described as extremely aggressive and territorial, attacking or killing hunters who have accidentally entered its territory. It is said that the creatures mark their territory by ramming large trees upside down into the earth, with the tree roots pointing to the sky. These pictures, taken from the documentary Monsters and Mysteries in Alaska, were recorded on Prince of Wales Island. Join Squatch Mafia at Patreon to watch the entire documentary. Friends of mine and uh, told me when they're hunting, he was about 15 years old and he hunted with an elder. And the old man told him, if you're ever hunting up on Kowak Mountain, you have to watch out for those big black gorillas that live up there. He told them then that he said they marked their territories by driving these blown down trees into the ground upside down. In a clearing, two cedars weighing nearly a thousand pounds stand inverted. Each cedar is driven seven to eight feet into the ground with roots facing skyward. The valley that we're looking at was logged in the early 90s. The trees reported inverted back in the 1940s. Alley looks for evidence of heavy logging machinery. The 11-foot cedar has nothing other than very minimal marks on it. Even a grapple would have left some serious marks in order to place it in a completely vertical position. There's no evidence the trees are a hoax. The local legend is clear what they believe is responsible. Other examples of inverted trees can be found in Alaska and the Pacific Northwest in general. A mystery that never has been debunked nor explained by mainstream science. The Dean also have other, darker tales and legends, which speak of nocturnal attacks on villages and settlements by the ghostly creatures, to steal livestock, in some stories even women or children. Also it is said that the Nantinok preys on lone wanderers and hunters in the wilderness and the forests at night, the reason why the Dean and the Athabascans call the creatures those who steal people. These stories were passed down from generation to generation.
The story of Port Chatham as a western settlement basically began in the late 19th century. Around 1900 a cannery was built and the settlement grew slowly on the rugged southern coast of the Kenai Peninsula. For around 20 years the villagers of Port Chatham, mostly of American, Russian and native heritage, lived from fishing, logging and some mining. Reports of gold miners and hunters gone missing in the area throughout the first two decades of the last century weren't necessarily uncommon back then. But what was strange was the frequency in which these mountain men were vanishing near Port Chatham. Although some of these disappearances can surely be attributed to the fierce Alaskan terrain and also to forest predators. The best documented missing person case in the early 20th century happened in 1917, as two hunters from Seward, by the names of Ben Sweezy and Bill Weaver, who left on a two-week hunting trip at the shores around Port Chatham by Dory Boat, vanished and never were found again. Search parties searched the region and found the Dory Boat of the two hunters at the mouth of a river. But the two hunters never were found again. Reports of large bipedal creatures seen wandering in the forests or at the shores of the region also weren't uncommon, just like the missing and disappeared persons throughout the years in the forests around Port Chatham were not. Those reports of sightings of mythological animals from the native tales were explained by the superstition or moonshine consume of the eyewitnesses, especially when they were of native heritage. It wasn't until the early 1930s that the terror began to strike in the woods and coastlines around Port Chatham. The first time the people of Port Chatham seriously began to remember the old native legends was in January 1931, as a logger named Andrew Canluck was killed in the forests outside Port Chatham while doing logging works. He was found dead after suffering a heavy blow to the head. The blow to the head was thought to have been carried out by someone or something of immense strength, for Kamluk's blood and brain mass was splattered on trees and logging equipment 10 feet behind him. Also the logging equipment, heavy machines made of steel and iron, was so heavily damaged that it was hard to find a rational explanation for what happened at the murder scene. An atmosphere of terror began to rise among the loggers, hunters and miners of the area. It is said that the first residents, mostly those of native families, already began to leave the small settlement after this event and moved to different places and towns on the peninsula. Later in the same year, in the spring of 1931, a well-respected Port Chatham fisherman named Tom Larson reported seeing a gigantic hairy creature walking on two legs on the forested coastline outside of Port Chatham in the morning hours, while Larson was returning from a fishing trip on his boat. He said the huge creature was looking at him and his boat and he was lucky to be on boat far away from the coastline. The last story from 1931 happened in the fall of that year, as a hunting party from Port Chatham was tracking a large moose in the mountains. After several hours of tracking they found that the moose had already been tracked by something else, something that left 18-inch human-like footprints, the hunters were in shock. Soon they came across a flattened spot in the brush where the moose tracks ended and where there was blood on the ground. They believed the Nantinop-like animal killed the moose and carried it away. Again the story began to spread quickly among the mountain men and other inhabitants of the southern Kenai Peninsula. In early 1932 some gold miners from nearby Port Graham disappeared on their way back home from Port Chatham. Their remains were never found. The small community began to lose residents constantly, the loggers and hunters of the region started to avoid the forests and coasts around the settlement. Later the year a group of cannery workers went into the forests to hunt. After two weeks one of their bodies, horribly mutilated, with broken bones and a fatal blow to the neck, was washed down the stream into Port Chatham. 
it seemed impossible that a known forest predator could have carried out such a vicious attack. At that point horror and an atmosphere of terror had a tight grip on the settlement of Port Chatham. The other men of the hunting party never were found. Throughout the 1930s it was a known fact that people disappeared in the forests and the coasts of the Port Chatham region, it was not too uncommon that human remains were showing up from time to time. The residents of other settlements and villages of the southern peninsula began to avoid Port Chatham totally. The people of Port Chatham blamed the unexplained deaths and disappearances on the mythological Nantinok, a horror they had no other name for, and that was said to be seen more and more in the forests and wastelands around the village. It is said that people also began disappearing out of nowhere and never returned home, even if they only left their house for a short walk with their dog or to enter a store in a nearby village. It was then that the townspeople officially gave up on the stretch of land and fled for safer living places. The events led the residents of the community to flee in masses. The village lost the most of the residents. Only a few people, often too old or too poor to move stayed. From around 1938 to 1940 it is reported that several door sheep hunters had disappeared in the hills outside Portlock, often in sight of the settlement. The dismembered bodies of some of the missing had washed ashore in the lagoon, it was nearly common that bodies began turning up around Port Chatham in nearby rivers, lagoons, and trails near the town. The bodies were often said to be completely mutilated and essentially torn to shreds. In early 1940 a routine and experienced hunter from Port Chatham disappeared next to the village and never returned home. A search team was sent out to look for the missing hunter. The team was shocked when they came across the body of the hunter in a creek. The body was mutilated and torn apart in a very peculiar way that nearly resembled a beheading and was not consistent with the attacks of a bear or wolves. It is said that after that day no one went into the forests around Port Chatham for hunting or logging again. In the next months and years the settlement was fully abandoned, only empty buildings remained. This relics survive to this day and can still be found on the beach and in the woods of the region. For several years the local post office was the last inhabited building, enduring sole and remote for nearly five years, before it was finally shut down in 1949. One last historic event from the abandoned area of Port Chatham was documented in the year 1968, nearly 20 years after the last resident of the settlement moved away. According to the 1969 Alaska magazine, a goat hunter was tracking game in the Port Lock area in winter of 1968. There he was suddenly chased by a creature that scared him out of the area. He later described the animal as being extremely large, bipedal and covered with fur. He said the animal was no bear and he was sure he never saw something like this before, nor had he heard of such an animal. One would think that a local hunter would be familiar with the predators in the area and be able to identify if one of those had been the thing to chase him. This is the last historic event from the Port Chatham area known to the public. Even though the village was abandoned in the 1940s, tales of what had gone on there still swirled around Alaska and the Pacific Northwest. The events of Port Chatham were widely documented in a series of articles from the Anchorage Daily News as well as in other newspaper articles. Various former residents of the settlement were interviewed in these articles. Also John Green's 1978 book Sasquatch, The Apes Among Us tells the basic story and gives some specifics. In the book former residents are quoted that all people left the village in 1949 due entirely to the gruesome attacks and still refuse to go back. In 
In the United States Census the settlement of Port Chatham was mentioned only once, in 1940 as unincorporated village with 31 residents. It was not mentioned before nor again in the following years. Interestingly the settlement was again mentioned in 1981, again with 30 residents, as people from nearby villages tried to re-establish the settlement. But there were no further appearances in the census until nine years later, as the settlement was again completely abandoned in 1990. Today some Alaska publications say travel to Port Chatham is possible via ATV but most locals would dispute that. The only real way to reach the remains of Port Chatham is to travel there by boat or by plane. Many dismiss the tales that have come out of Port Chatham due to the aggressive nature of the Nantinok, as the locals called the creature. But there are more historic encounter stories from Alaska that are more vicious and aggressive than the most known Sasquatch encounters. In 1900, a group of hair-covered creatures ran at a prospector who had climbed a tree in an attempt to get his bearings near Thomas Bay, Alaska. The prospector said they were the most hideous creatures. I couldn't call them anything but devils, he said. The prospector was injured but survived. In 1920, a man named Albert Pecker, who lived on his boat near Nulato, Alaska, was attacked by what he described as a Bushman or a Neanderthal. He survived the attack but Pecker's injuries proved fatal. He was able to tell the story of the attack before dying. A similar story comes from 1943 during the height of the siege of Port Chatham, from a place named De Wilde's Camp near Ruby, Alaska. The victim, a man named John Meyer, was a Dutch mountain man. He said he was attacked by a large gorilla-like animal outside the camp and badly beaten by the attacker. Meyer was able to get to his boat and travel to the nearest village to seek help but he died of internal injuries a few days after arriving in civilization. Hit the like button if you have enjoyed this video on Port Chatham on the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska, deep in Bigfoot territory. Subscribe to the Squatch Mafia channel at YouTube for more videos on Bigfoot, Sasquatch and Cryptozoology. Join Squatch Mafia at Patreon for more Bigfoot documentaries and encounter videos. Thank you for Squatching.